So I am delighted to uh, welcome you all to this uh, conversation with my friend and colleague Seth Archer from Utah State University in Logan, Utah. And this is the first of our planned institute series of discussions with scholars who are captivated by islands and think about islands in scholarly ways and other ways, I'm sure. Um, so uh, uh, thank you, Seth, for giving us the time today. Happy to be here, thanks. Um, let's just start off with the most casual uh, intellectual biography. You've had a really interesting pathway to where you are now in the history department at, at Logan. Just tell us a little bit about your background and your training. Yeah, interesting is a generous word to describe it. I mean, I, I tend to think of it more as random. Uh, this is a second career for me. My first career um, was in creative writing. It, I, I call it a career. It was hardly a career because I, I kind of flailed um, my way into poetry and then um, struggled to publish and struggled to find good work beyond just the adjunct teaching that I was doing in the early 2000s. But you know what happened? It, it's, it is weird and it is uh, unique uh, as far as I can tell. Something that I was writing, a piece of creative writing, it was actually a personal essay about a lynching in my home state of Oklahoma, a lynching of a woman and her, and her son, teenage son, turned into a history article without my note knowing it. Um, so, and maybe you've heard that story before. I still have not quite heard, heard that story. That so I looked at this piece that I was writing and I said, this is not a personal essay. This is, I'm writing history with footnotes and all the rest. And I said, well, maybe that's what I should do. Maybe I should be a historian. So now that was uh, the notorious, was that Okima? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, yeah, and my we way once talked about Woody Guthrie. That's those. right. Yep. And my way into this was essentially, it actually began with the Tulsa race pogrom or Tulsa race ride of 1921, which is now famous, but really nobody knew about um, that, that event. Um, and it wasn't in my high school history textbooks. This is a more common story. And so when I learned of the Tulsa race riot in the, I guess that was the late 90s, I was just floored. I, I just could not believe that I, I didn't know about this story. That led me to the lynching, which Woody Guthrie um, struggled to write about because of his own father's involvement in it and in the, and in the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and as I said, uh, um, pretty soon it was not about my experience growing up in Oklahoma. It was not about my, um, my really uh, paltry historical education in that state. It was about the events themselves. So I, I managed to place that essay, I guess it ended up being not a history article, but an essay in a literary journal and then I said, okay, I think this is what I want to do. And I knew it was either going to be African American history or Native American history. Um, and when I started my master's program, I decided that there was much more, um, much more good work on African American history than on Native American history. That's essentially how I decided to go, go this route. I mean, we're still a long way from Hawaii, I, I realize, but we'll get there. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yep. So that's how I that's how I came to the profession. So graduate school at UC Riverside. Well, first your MA. First I did a master's first in Virginia, um, yeah. and that program was focused um, on colonial American history, which is still one of the worlds I sort of um, uh, work in. Um, but the but that that program was strictly American history. They didn't they didn't do any global or anything beyond um, the United States, colonial American United States, and so. Once I discovered Hawaii as a potential project, that's when I started looking to California, and that's how I ended up at UC Riverside. So tell us about that discovery of Hawaii as a potential project. Was that as, uh, let's say, uh, serendipitous as moving to the literary essay and finding yourself in graduate school? As random, you mean? Yeah, I, I would say it was <laughs> entirely random. Um, well, not entirely. As I, can, as I can reconstruct it, what I was doing as a master's student uh, in colonial American history in Virginia, is I was trying to get my head around the, um, the role of disease in Native American history generally, but especially in the colonial period. Um, you know, the early contributors to this question would be Alfred Crosby, the environmental historians essentially, who, um, who thought about things like the Columbian Exchange and virgin soil epidemics. Um, when I was starting my master's program, there was a strong backlash against that historiography. Um, that portrayed that um, scholarship as um, deterministic, as um, in some cases a justification for conquest. In other words, 
the revisionist scholarship was saying, you know, Crosby and, and his like, they were good historians and they, they contributed something, but it was too simple. And that narrative of the disease impact in, in native um, societies, um, it was a just so story. And it was also, um, as I said, it could be used as a justification for conquest. So they were revisiting that narrative, the narrative of, and I was looking for a case study to figure out if they were right. If, if in fact, um, the, the traditional narrative, the sort of environmental um, story about disease and its impact on native societies had been overblown, exaggerated, um, what exactly? Mm -hmm. And the new scholarship, I'll try, to, I'll try to keep this brief, but the new scholarship focused on, it, it would be obvious to you, colonialism, all the effects of colonialism. So go down the list, warfare, enslavement, land expropriation, um, forced removals, that all of those colonial factors are what drove the health story. The, 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 they um, caused diseases to spread, especially something like enslavement, slave trade, caused diseases to spread and made those diseases more impactful. I was looking for a case study to figure out if that was true, or if, as Crosby and others had argued earlier in the 60s and 70s, that disease um, had a, had a singular force um, ac across the Americas or in, in particular places. And Hawaii was that case study. Why is that? Because there was, in the colonial period at least, up until about 1850, there was no enslavement. There was no exogenous warfare. That is, the, the wa warfare that occurred was between Hawaiians, Native Hawaiians. There was um, practically no land expropriation, and there were practically no settlers in Hawaii until well into the 19th century. So none of the factors that the revisionist scholarship uh, was pointing to were present. So I thought, okay, this, this could be a case study to figure out well, what exactly you is. Also, sorry, uh, Seth, but you also get to look at a really fairly yes. abbreviated period of historical velocity of that change, I bet. That's right. right. And um, unlike the rest of Native North America, um, Hawaii uh, was a contained and isolated place where, where I could actually figure out what was happening. It's, it's virtually impossible. I mean, scholars like Pekka Hamelainen managed to do this, but it's virtually impossible to trace things like the health impact on Comanches because they're on horseback and they're all over the place. Right. Um, very, very hard. Whereas Hawaii, not only was it isolated and contained, it was also a hierarchical kingdom. So I could kind of figure out what decisions were being made um, in a way that would be harder with a sort of more egalitarian native society. So I can see absolutely the attractions of uh, what amounts to a case study to test these theories um, where I am equally or more impressed is a lot of us when we choose our dissertations choose something that seems familiar. We choose a familiar ground. We choose um, perhaps uh, places that we grew up in and want to study. What's your relationship to Hawaii before you become a scholar of it? None. And no, no uh, trepidation. <laughs> lots of trepidation. Uh, sure, lots of trepidation. But um, there are other advantages. Uh, um, to be brief, the, the other main advantages of Hawaii, contact with Europeans was really late. It occurred in 1778 instead of, you know, 1519 or 1492. Um, so 1778, the people who are arriving are, in many cases, fig, uh, enlightenment scientists. James Cook, whatever you, you make of his impact on the Pacific, um, was uh, an incredibly intelligent man who documented everything, including the first transmission of an infectious disease to the Hawaiian people, which he understood well because he had already seen it break out in Tahiti. So, the, the documentary source was unparalleled, and then indigenous uh, Hawaiian language sources were also unparalleled. Yeah, so this, this notion, I mean, we, we can stipulate that we don't think islands are tabula rasa of human experience because there's obviously you know, human experience prior to contact conquest and colonialism. However, is it a generally understood notion that those who study islands have a sensibility about their case studiness that you know you can mark these changes perhaps in not a laboratory setting but there's certain features of many islands that allow for historians to get in there and see things not in real time but perhaps with the clarity that the islands um what separation from the continents allow 
I think so. And every epidemiologist would agree with that statement. Historians are, are less, um, I think, less um, open to the idea of, well, just to come back to where the historiography was when I started, the historiography of the Pacific, in, in contrast to the historiography of sort of the disease in Native American uh, societies, the histor historiography on the Pacific was all about connection and networks, still is really. It's, a, it's global history, right? It's about how these various um, societies um, traded, exchanged, voyaged. Well, um, an exception to that rule is infectious disease, where um, isolation is, is decisive, frankly. It's a decisive factor in what, uh, what, how, how that disease plays out. So at, um, at the same time that I was sort of questioning the, uh, or um, offering a new, a new way to look at the scholarship on uh, colonial America and Native American health, I was offering a, um, again, I guess it's an older version of thinking about the Pacific that um, in the ways that matter related to health, isolation matters um, right. a great deal. So when you're, you know, you mentioned Cook and obviously you're gonna read your Cook um, if you're studying Hawaii. Um, but just this notion about the island's isolation in general and what that is generative of or protects the island inhabitants from. Do you also go off early in your training and read Darwin? <laughs> um, I had read some of Darwin in my first career as, um, as a, as a would-be creative writer. I mean, his, especially the Journal of the Beagle, which is just a, it doesn't matter what field you're in, it's just a right. marvelous book. Um, and so, yeah, Darwin was probably one of the early, um, early uh, scholars to understand the importance of, of islands as, mm -hmm. yeah, as petri dishes, essentially, right? Exactly, yeah. And, um, you know, the extent to which that extends to culture, I think, is, is a really tricky, challenging, debatable um, issue. I, I, I think, in some ways, it can extend to culture. I mean, just to take the case of Hawaii, which um, for listeners who haven't looked at, um, at a globe recently, because a flat map doesn't show you just how far Hawaii is from the rest of everywhere, um, the islands of the South Pacific were, were connected culturally um, through voyages, um, politically in many cases, but Hawaii is, is more than a thousand miles from the South Pacific. And when Cook arrives there, um, 1776, 1778, uh -huh. um, all the archaeological evidence and oral tradition tells us that Hawaii had not been contacted for about 400 years. So <laughs> um, there are going to be cultural differences. And sure enough, there, there were. I mean, these, this is one of the things that Cook is, is fascinated by. And he's, he's, make, he's constantly making comparisons to uh, Tahitian society islanders and Hawaiians. So when you, when you encounter Hawaii in your work, um, obviously there's scholarship on Hawaii of all disciplines, et cetera, but do you still feel that it's scholarly isolation is still a real thing and that Hawaii demands uh, a great deal of our attention because of the qualities of, um, well, uh, qualities of scholarly insight that can be brought to it? I think so, yeah. I, I, I certainly came across a lot of topics that went into my footnotes that I thought, wow, that, that would be something to work on, um, not by me, but by someone. And I also think that the Cook journals themselves um, are ripe for revisitation. That is, I would say starting in the 90s, maybe the early 2000s, people, um, especially Pacific scholars, um, started to treat them as uh, cookbooks. They disparagingly called them the, the cookbooks. Um, and went to other sources. And of course, other sources are great, but I was just, I was, I was pretty astonished that um, no one had really looked at the health, just the health information, which was really all I was trying to do in this book was to offer a sort of health history of Hawaii, that no one had, um, had really discussed that material at all. And just to give you one striking example that shows up in the first chapter of my book, um, Cook and his men spread at least two in, uh, infectious diseases and, and probably three. The Hawaiians, gonorrhea, syphilis, both of which are sexually transmitted infections, and tuberculosis. All of all these three diseases had had uh, profound impacts on Hawaiian society. Um, 
he documents all of these diseases and he uh, actually prohibits his men from, when they arrive at Hawaii, prohibits his men from having sexual intercourse with Hawaiian women, which they promptly def defy. He records uh, punishments for this defiance, including being, um, his men being whipped on the, on the deck of the ship. Um, he reflects at length about the, his failure to prevent these diseases from spreading and what it will mean long term for the Hawaiian people. It's, it's all there in the Cook journals. Amazing. So tell us, the, uh, the book came out two years ago? Yeah. Uh, Cambridge University Press, remind us of the title. Sharks Upon the Land, Colonialism, Indigenous Health and Culture in Hawaii. One of the greatest uh, first uh, clause titles I've heard from a, a scholarly monograph in a long time. Um, so let's cut to the chase a little bit. Um, Crosby and others argument about the singularity of disease impact upon indigenous cultures versus, I mean, there's some room between singularity, deterministic, and the whole set of other causes, right? There's some That's right. continuity here. But um, it sounds as if what you just said about those three diseases that Cook documents, it sounds as if your determination is in the Crosby camp. Is that fair? It is in the Crosby camp. And as you've just described, uh, there's so much room in the middle there. But this case study um, reveals that uh, wh whatever else you want to say about the impact of colonialism in, in Hawaii, and there's a lot to say, and, and my book tries to cover as much as it can, disease came first. It, it came immediately when these men got off, off the ship. And we know that because Cook comes back to Hawaii nine months later, and before he arrives at, um, he had only been, he'd only seen two islands, he'd only visited two islands, and before he arrives at Maui and the Big Island, uh, Hawaiian men come out to the ship in canoes and point to their genitals and said, and say, look what you did to us. Literally. That's, that's, wow. and, and no one else had been on the islands in, in the interim. So we know for a fact that, that these diseases were spread by them. And um, that, that came first. That, that's, it, it's, it's a small point to make, but um, before anyone was well, not asleep, really, right? It's not really. I mean, that's a, pr that's a primary point. I mean, it's a primary argument. I guess so, I, I, but, but all I really wanna say is that disease cannot be relegated to a sidebar in, in right. our stories. It, it, is a, it is a principal means of colonialism, of, of the uh, consequences of encounter, whatever you wanna call it. It's not secondary to other, the other business of colonialism. That's, right. If there's a single takeaway, that's what it is. And those three, um, those three are pretty hard hitting. Uh, on any population across generations of, you know, morbidity, mortality, birth rate, uh, et cetera. Dis uh, social dislocation. That's right. You know, disease could be the primary operator there to further socially dislocate the society, right? Yeah, that's right. And um, th um, the question, you just raised the question of fertility. I spend a lot of time in the book thinking about fertility. All three of those diseases affect the f fertility, not only of women, but of men. And uh, sure enough, the population really goes into a tailspin. Um, not because of, again, enslavement, warfare, these other causes, but because um, the population is struggling with brand new epidemics and those epidemics are impacting their fertility. Yeah. So how late do you take the study? I take it to 1855, which um, was, a, was a tough decision to make because in 1855, little has changed, frankly. It's just the diseases that are new. So it's mumps and measles and smallpox instead of tuberculosis, uh, syphilis, and gonorrhea. But um, I, there are sort of arbitrary and career reasons why I stopped there because I had to stop somewhere. But the other major reason is by that point, the population has, um, has dropped by 90% from, uh, from In 70 years. In 80 years, yeah. Yeah. And... Um, that is kind of what, what I was trying to, um, as, the, as a case study, I was trying to figure out, well, how impactful could disease, uh, how impactful could the health uh, scenario be um, um, before these other colonial uh, impacts were seen? So right. by the 1850s, Americans do start to call the shots. They do start to take land. There's never enslavement but, uh, or warfare, but the, uh, the health story is harder at that point to separate out from the other colonial impacts. Right. But the impacts that you studied 
in those 80 years have made it all the more easy for those Americans to further dominate them because you've decimated the native peoples. Yeah, and it extends, it extends all the way to things like basic labor in an agricultural society. The Hawaiian monarchy um, doesn't believe it has sufficient native Hawaiian laborers to continue to be an agricultural society. So this is the main reason that they start to um, welcome or rather invite Asian laborers, first from China, then from Japan, Korea, then over to Portugal. I mean, they, they have a labor crisis because they have a health crisis. Yeah, fascinating. So the whole story about Hawaii as this, as this um, you know, a melting pot of, of cultures really, in, in, in my book, um, is a story of, of health challenges then <laughs> causing this. Right. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And, and you, you've made the point about the kind of special case study um, opportunities in island studies. So uh, that helps uh, us open our series. So I'm really grateful to you for that. I've got to ask you, in this time of pandemic, uh, with your interest in training in uh, the history of epidemi epidemiological history, um, do you think about things through a different lens than perhaps others of us? Uh, I, I guess the, maybe not. Um, <laughs> the only way I, I think I might think about them, th about them differently is um, on um, populations, indigenous populations that have not had a lot of contact with uh, the broader world. So the obvious examples are in the Amazon basin, uh, Papua New Guinea. These places, we're already seeing it actually among indigenous Amazon, Amazon people. Um, COVID-19 is going to, um, it's going to be ugly in those places. Yeah. Um, and it's not just because of poverty, although poverty is, is, is certainly a part of it. Um, and I guess that's the, that's the comparison um, I think about. I, I also think about sort of after the vaccine. We have, we're so much focused on, on the vaccine now, um, but a, a number of these diseases that broke out uh, in epidemic proportions in Hawaii, there was a vaccine, but did people get it? Of course not. It wasn't, you know, it, the question of, all, every native Hawaiian could have been in, uh, vaccinated for smallpox, for instance, before smallpox broke out. Um, I think, my, I think in my book, I found that it, the cost would have been 10 cents per Hawaiian to vaccinate them wow. against a disease, disease that everybody knew eventually would arrive, uh, arrive, yeah. arrive, and it did from San Francisco, but um, people weren't protected. So there will be a vaccine, presumably, for this disease uh, eventually. Who will get it? Exactly. Yeah, this notion that somehow COVID-19 is an equal opportunity pathogen, et cetera. Um, not, not, not viable. I mean, no, yeah, no, it's not, not at all. So Seth, tell us a little bit about what you're working on now. Well, what I'm working on now, it, it does not involve Hawaii and it does not involve islands, sadly. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, miss, I'll miss working on islands because, well, for a lot of reasons, but I've come back to native North America and I'm thinking about um, smallpox actually. Um, it, in two, two major areas, I'm thinking about uh, the first public health campaign that was run by the uh, U.S. federal government, which is doubly ironic because it involved non-citizens, that is Native Americans, and it occurred during Indian removal, that is the ethnic cleansing campaign that the federal government was um, organized around under Andrew Jackson. The federal government, the Congress, passed a um, vaccination act for Native Americans in 1832. This is two years after the Indian Removal Act. And so the question historians have always asked, um, those who have bothered uh, to think about this, is why? Why would a federal government that wants to get rid of Native Americans um, protect their health, try to protect their health? Um, but I, and that's an interesting question that doesn't have a good answer yet, so I'm interested in that. But the second question is, why would a federal government um, op, uh, uh, launch a public health campaign for non-citizens? Um, and, and a government that was designed to be largely ineffective, small, um, out of the people's business. Um, why, would, why would this occur? So that's one project. The other one is about, it's, a, it's sort of a broader um, canvas, all of North America, and thinking about Native people who either requested vaccination, sought it out on their own, um, passed it along to trading partners and uh, kin, distant kin, there are, there are a number of records about this on the plains, especially in the 19th century, that native people after seeing smallpox hit, their, hit them over and over 
decided that, you know what, vaccination um, was, a, was a good thing and yeah. they were gonna try to get it. Fascinating. Yeah, I, I can't thank you enough for uh, talking to us. We've already exhausted our time. I think uh, congratulations on the publication of the book, um, which at least from my vantage point seemed to hurry right along from dissertation to book. It may have been different in, in your, at your desk, but congratulations and you've really helped us think about uh, Highlands and what they offer to scholars such as yourself and uh, others out there. So thank you. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Okay, so I'll just click.